And our next speaker here is Hida DeFries, member of Open UI, accessibility teacher and advocate, ARIA expert, previously a member of the W3C, rad front end blogger, teacher, conference and workshop professional, spec spelunker, front end fire breather. Get ready for today's dialogues and popover talk. Here is Hida to take it away. <laughs> Wow, that was a lot. Um, well, so cool to be here and, and to have seen Yuna's talk this morning. Uh, I am so excited about all the CSS stuff that is coming to us and that we're going to hear about uh, in the next few days. I'm going to do a deep dive, uh, as Adam said, into dialogues and popovers and into sort of modal overlays. Uh, because we all no, like the web has shifted from being sort of a linear medium with like text and things to a medium where we have lots of stuff that overlaps in all sorts of ways. Like um, if you read an article on The Economist that will have an audio player and then it has a little bubble that tells you how the audio player works. That kind of interaction is super common these days. Uh, it's not just text, it gets augmented and especially if we build web apps, there's just a lot of reasons why you would put stuff on top of your UI and then build those kind of things. Now, I'm going to focus on two different parts of the HTML specification that I'm very excited about. Uh, one is the dialogue element. The other is the popover attribute. The dialogue element is a HTML element that has been around for a while. Uh, in recent times, it also got very good browser support across all the browsers. It was part of Interop 2022, I think. Um, and as of recent, it also has good accessibility support. Now, popover is an attribute that uh, is fairly new. Uh, it was born at uh, OpenUI, a community group at the W3C. Uh, and uh, it is in the Chrome stable as of, as of two weeks ago. And it is coming to Safari as well in the fall, I heard. Now, of course, I am aware of this website called modalsmodalsmodals.com, which was built by Adrian, who I think is here uh, in the audience. Uh, I know modals aren't always great. Uh, they can sometimes be anti-patterns, um, and there are lots of reasons why not to use them. I won't be focusing on that today, though. I will be talking about if you are building modals or if you are building dialogues, how should you do it? So we'll look at different UI considerations, semantics, and a bit of positioning as well. Now, my name is Hida. I work at the NL Design System team at the Dutch government, where I do a bit of developer relations and a bit of accessibility. Uh, as Anna mentioned, I'm also a participant at the Open UI community group, and I have my own blog that you can like and, uh, and subscribe to with RSS. Uh, this is what it looks like. Uh, later today, we have a really cool talk by Sophie Kunin, who is going to talk about personal websites. Um, I'm very excited for that. I've seen it a couple of weeks ago in, in Dusseldorf. Um, on my blog, I basically write lots of articles. Uh, and what I usually do is I have something that I think I understand, or I know I kind of almost understand. Then I start writing about it, and I find out where the gaps in my knowledge are. It's a bit like defragmenting the brain. And I, that's not my phrase. I don't know where I got it from, but that's kind of what it does for me. So you write stuff down, and you find out, hey, actually, I don't really understand this, uh, this problem. Uh, I can recommend doing that. So if you're a student or if you're a seasoned CSS developer, do write about the stuff that you think you understand, and you'll find out maybe where the gaps are. Uh, it is helpful for yourself, and it's really helpful for others as well, because this kind of stuff is really interesting uh, uh, to read if you are just learning. Now, I also really like music and films and concerts and books, basically art, especially in this time where we're told that um, AI can make art with one press of a button on a computer. Uh, I started to hold on more to kind of the, the art that I enjoyed. So sort of listening to a song or watching a film or going to a concert and that experience that I have, uh, like going there with a friend uh, and actually enjoying uh, that thing. So I wanted to do something with that on my personal website because it's personal. Now, there are popovers and dialogues that could be annoying to the end user. Like recently, when I was in a chat on Microsoft Teams, it gave me a popover to ask me for feedback. 
another time I was in a very serious business meeting and it asked me about an integration with Excel through a popover. Um, and it even asked me to be my expressive self uh, by joining some kind of program where I could have an avatar uh, in this thing. And you can see I'm, I'm not impressed uh, by it. I do like what um, Slack does. It basically shows you when you hover, uh, you look nice today. And it always does. I don't think it has anything to actually check. It just tells you every day, which I think is, is very cool. Um, there are really good serious use cases, though, for popovers. Uh, as I mentioned, the web is now a place where we have to hide content sometimes to make it work better. Uh, so in this case, like if I go to my online banking and I search for something, it's going to give me search suggestions in an autocomplete kind of thing, a list box. If I transfer money, it's going to ask me for a date with a date picker. Uh, so all these kinds of patterns, they're perfectly uh, uh, valid and, and good things that you might want to have in your uh, web app. So when I wanted to look at sort of what a dialogue is, I realized when I went through lots of blog posts about dialogues that there aren't that many that actually define clearly what a dialogue is. Uh, this is what I've come up with. It's an additional window to your main window. Uh, some specs, they call it a sub-window or a descendant window. Uh, I don't actually know very well what a window is. Like, of course, there's windows that we browse in, but then like, what, what is a window and when does it not constitute a window? I, I do find that a bit tricky. Another way to look at dialogues is basically what's in them. So usually they contain a task or some kind of action. Often they contain critical information like, oh, you're exiting this presentation field. Maybe you want to save your changes or something like that. Um, some design systems call it a conversation between the system and the user, which I kind of like. Uh, it will ask questions like, hey, do you want to continue? Yes or no? Uh, you are opening a new file. What do you want to do with the current one? Uh, or if you're cropping this image, where do you want the hotspot to be? Uh, all these kinds of things uh, could be in a dialogue. Now, there is a HTML element for dialogues, as mentioned before. And it comes in with a built-in dialogue role, as well as a modal setting. Uh, so that's the dialog HTML element. When you have these in your page, you can find them in the DOM and call the show modal method on them. That will show them as a modal. You can also call the show method on them, in which case they're shown as a non-modal. So these are the two things you can uh, do. Now, at this point, it would be important to point out that uh, we have a few different things going on. So we have the dialog element, which is the element that comes with the role and with the modal setting. and it closes on escape, these sorts of things. And then we have divs with the role of dialogue. And you'll probably have these in your application, because until recently, the actual dialogue element was discouraged for, for use. Um, but the difference is that with this one, you only get the semantics, not the behavior. So you may have seen buttons or links that are built with just a role. And that will give the semantics, but it doesn't give any of the other stuff, like when you have a link with the role of link, and that's basically just a div, then it won't actually show you open in a new tab when you right click, or those kind of nuances will, will miss. And it's the same for the role of dialogue. If you add that to a div, you still need to do all of your dialogue behavior uh, manually. So that is a different thing. And then, of course, there is just a word dialogue. So you might be talking with your colleagues about uh, what you're going to build, and they might be talking about dialogues. And that could be either of these two things, or it could be none of them. So if we're talking about these, like we need to be careful to distinguish between dialogue element and just divs that have the role or just the word. Now, dialogue is well supported in all of the evergreen browsers. Uh, I do recommend, if you're interested in some of the accessibility nitty gritty for dialogue, this post by Scott O'Hara called Use the Dialogue Element Reasonably. Uh, it goes into a lot of detail um, and it has links to some previous posts. There is one that was archived, but it has a lot of detail about what was previously wrong with the dialogue element and, and what has improved since. Going on to popovers. So popovers are a floating piece of UI with supplemental or contextual content. Some design systems also call it a non-modal dialogue or transient content. Um, and when they call it a non-modal dialogue, of course, the space between dialogue and the popover starts to be a little uh, blurry. When we're talking about HTML, the popover attribute is an attribute that gives you a set of behaviors that you can add. Uh, you can build things like content pickers. So that could be emoji pickers or color pickers or date pickers. 
Uh, form element suggestions is something you can build. So if you're building a combo, combo box, that could be a popover or an autocomplete kind of thing. Action menus, so when you have an application that has actions, uh, select box uh, or the list box of a select uh, element, and also teaching UI, so things that show you, hey, we've got this new feature, this is how it works. These are all use cases for popover. And one of the things, and, and Yuna showed this before, that I'm really excited about when it comes to popover is that it doesn't require JavaScript in its uh, setup. So if you have a button and a div, and the div is your popover, you basically make it a popover by applying the popover attribute to it. Then it becomes a popover. That's the time when that happens. And then when you add an ID and point to that from your popover target attribute on the button, you've now connected the two, and the button is basically going to toggle the popover for you. You don't need to have any JavaScript here uh, to make that part work. Uh, and I think that's very powerful. We had something like that with details and summary before, where you can open and close stuff. Uh, but this one is actually meant for popovers, and it has some behaviors that are uh, very useful. Now, we have this in popover, and I wonder here in the audience, if you see this, would you want something like this also for dialogues? Would that be helpful to have dialogues open with, yeah? What you can do, there's an issue at the What Working Group. It's not in CSS Working Group space technically, uh, but there is an issue about this. And they are thinking about making it possible to actually open uh, dialogues with just HTML so that you don't need JavaScript to do that bit. So you can go in there, post a comment if you have something interesting to say about it. You can also press that uh, thumbs up button uh, that is there. and. Um, yeah, show your, your uh, appreciation for it, uh, because then it might actually make it into browsers. I think that would be really helpful. Uh, of course, we might still need JavaScript for some things, uh, but because dialogues can already close and work together with form elements, there could be lots of stuff possible without shipping JavaScript and making experiences a whole lot faster, because it also means you're shipping less bytes to your user. Going back to popover, uh, there is also the popover target action attribute, where you can specify exactly what you want your button to do. So by default, it's going to toggle. Uh, you can also set it to only show or only hide, so if you have a close button or something like that. Now, there are different modes. Uh, there's the auto mode, which will close other popovers when it's opened, uh, and it has like this miss. And then there is the manual mode, which uh, doesn't have that, so it doesn't close others, and it doesn't do like this miss. New modes are also being discussed, like the hint mode. Uh, but that this is what is currently shipping in, in browsers. Of course, if you want to, you can also do all this in your script. So if you do something like a feedback thing that pops up after a certain time, you can absolutely do that, because in JavaScript, you can uh, listen to something and then just show that. So that will, uh, that will work. Now, the support story for popover is a bit less positive, I guess, than the dialogue, but it is all coming. So it shipped in uh, stable Chrome just two weeks ago. Uh, it's also in stable Edge. I don't know if that's released as of now, but it's there. Um, then it is in Safari 17, which will come out in the fall, and it is being worked on in, uh, in Firefox and active development. So uh, I'm excited to see this come to browsers and actually start to get some usage. Now, as I mentioned before, uh, when I kind of learned about Popover and, and worked on what the behaviors were and, and also sat in these meetings, I always felt like, how do these things actually differ? Like, how is a dialogue different from a Popover? Uh, so I came up with a bunch of different axes that I think they, they differ on. Uh, and I want to take you through those so that you can see the differences uh, for yourself. So the first one is modal versus non-modal. So a modal Dialogue is something that is the only thing that the user can interact with. Uh, so if your business has decided to track your users, according to your PE law, you need to ask their permission. So before you can do any tracking, you'll need to, to ask that. So I think a modal dialogue would be a good, uh, good choice there. As you can see, when you're tabbing into that, uh, it shouldn't allow you to go behind the modal. You can only choose between, yes, I do want this, or no, or you know, the options that are available to you uh, uh, for your uh, privacy consent. Another example of a modal is when you're logged into a Dutch government website, it's going to tell you your session is about to expire. Uh, because if you use the Digity system, uh, which is the central login in the Netherlands, 
uh, it has a 15-minute timeout, so it will uh, need to be warned about uh, a bit before that because WCAG requires so, uh, and it's a nice thing to do. You want to give users plenty of time and allow them to extend their session. So that is something that a model like this could uh, allow you to do. And it would be a lot better than a non-modal because it's something that the user shouldn't miss because it is going to affect their ability to do stuff on the page. Like often on government websites, people are filling out very long forms. We're working on that. We want to make those shorter. Uh, but still, they might be working on that for a lot more than 50 minutes and don't want to lose their data. So this is important. Another example of a modal is when you're playing a game and it shows game over, you're not allowed to go back to your game. You can't go and collect more points. This is it. You're game over, and the only thing you can do is like go back and start over or something like that. I think that's also a modal interaction in a sense because the rest of the game is disappeared. You cannot interact with it. You can't do anything else. It's just game over right there. Now, examples of non-modal are uh, like a share button where you get a bunch of links uh, that you can use to share, or uh, image description boxes that are on some social media, or menus that appear in some CMSs where you can like replace an image or delete it or things like that, the kebab menus, basically. Chat widgets as well. Uh, this is a great example for like this miss because often users will want to book their train instead of chatting to your chatbot. So it's good if that disappears when you click outside of it, I think. Now, a modal element is somewhat of a drastic measure because the user cannot do anything else. So you want to make that choice very consciously. Uh, sometimes it just makes a lot of sense to say, hey, this is the one thing that the user needs to do right now. But don't do it all the time because it can annoy users as well. Now, the second thing that they differ on is how they're dismissed. So uh, some elements, some dialogues will dismiss explicitly. That's when you have a button available and button needs to be clicked in order to leave your dialog. In other cases, there is light dismiss, which is basically what happens when you choose a font in Google. Uh, when you click outside of it, it's going to disappear. So light dismiss basically uh, means that the element automatically hides when you click outside or some other heuristic like when you're scrolling. And yeah, if you click outside of it, uh, or there's a button available or, or a script, then that's explicit dismiss. Now, a third thing where they differ is how you're doing your layering. So we probably all know that the Z index property allows you to order things. So when there are multiple things in the same place on your page, you can use Z index to say, oh, this one is going to be above that other one. So the highest number basically wins. The top layer is a concept uh, that is fairly new to the web platform. It was there for full screen content, and it's there for, for dialogues and popovers. It's basically above everything else. So it's above all of your z-indexing. The z-indexing happens in like the main document, and the top layer is basically like a sibling to the HTML element. It's separate, and everything in the top layer will always be above. Uh, it's really a, a separate thing. It's shown as a separate thing, like in the, in the Firefox inspector. Uh, it shows it right underneath the HTML element visually. If you want to decide the order of rendering in the top layer, you basically do that by choosing when you're putting something into the top layer. So if you have one thing and then you add something later, it will appear above just because it was added later. So it's about the ordering of when you add stuff to the page. Then some of your elements might have backdrops. Uh, that sometimes makes a lot of sense. Like in modal overlays, that's a very common pattern. You want to show to the user that they can't interact with the rest of the page. Uh, top layer elements, they have that built in. It's a stylable backdrop. So with the colon, colon, backdrop in CSS, you're able to do whatever you want with the backdrop. You can make it pink. You can add blur effects and all these sorts of things. And then the last one, keyboard focus trap, is what you want to do often in modal overlays. Uh, because you want to prevent people from leaving that component with their tab key, because they're only going to be able to do that one thing. Uh, and sometimes it also makes sense in non-modal environments. For instance, if you have a very complex calendar widget, it might be good for users to not accidentally leave that, that thing. Now, that's always temporary, right? If you have something that's always trapping the uh, keyboard focus, you do violate the, the WCAG standard. So these are the differences between the different components that we can build on the web today, the dialogues and the popovers. So I want to show you how each of them relates to these different patterns. So you get something that's modal when you use dialogue with the show modal method. Then you get something that's non-modal when you use dialogue with the show method or a popover. So they are the non-modal thing, and modal is 
the only way to get something modal natively with the web is to do show modal on a dialog. Now, when it comes to dismiss, uh, light dismiss comes with popover equals auto, and then explicit dismiss comes with popover equals manual, or with any dialog. Then um, the difference in layering, basically, uh, popover and dialog with show modal, they go in the top layer, and anything else you'll have to manage with ZNX. So dialog with show, but also any div or whatever you have. Then backdrops, you only get those from the browser if your element is in the top layer. So that's popovers and modal dialogs. Uh, and note that if you are about to add a backdrop to a popover, do consider maybe this is actually a modal, because you are obscuring the rest of the content. So if you're doing that, maybe you also want to make it impossible to do anything with the rest of the content. If you're obscuring it visually, you might as well obscure it in all the other ways as well. So do consider that. And then when it comes to keyboard focus trap, that is something that comes for free with only the modal dialogues. OK, so when we have these differences um, out of the way, it's also really important to consider what the semantics actually are. Uh, so semantics uh, is basically an answer to the question, what is this thing? Um, it is in, um, uh, so it, philosophers have, have this question, right? They talk about semantics, and they will ask, like, what is this thing uh, in the world? And they disagree about it. They do like categories, and they say, you know, this is apples, this is pears, this is somewhat in between. On the web, it is a little bit easier in a way, because we've standardized what the kind of things are that exist on the web. So if we want to answer, what is this thing on the page, that's actually something that has been defined in HTML, um, in ARIA sometimes. We know what the things are. We only need to kind of choose from that list that already exists. So we have things like headings. So when you use a H1 element, it has the heading semantic, the heading role. And that then gets used by software, because we all agree that H1s are headings. So software can actually interpret that. So a screen reader will allow you to browse by heading, which is actually one of the most uh, common ways that blind users will go through a website. The anchor tag uh, comes with uh, a link semantic. A list item comes with a list item semantic. Dialog comes with dialog semantic. And then we have the div that comes with nothing. And that's also fine if you want to build something that doesn't have a particular uh, semantic. Now, as I mentioned earlier, you can add roles to divs to give them that semantic. Um, and you can add the popover attribute, at which point you don't get any semantic built in. It doesn't come with the attribute. So the popover attribute adds behavior, but not semantics. So that's something we'll have to do ourselves. Uh, and I want to walk you through a couple of different options that you have when you're building a popover. So popovers don't have one specific semantic. That's the reason that it's not uh, one of the reasons, that it's not an element, but it's an attribute. It adds behavior a bit like tap index and content editable attributes do. Uh, they add behavior to an element. They don't change the semantics. The first one is dialogue. So dialogue is. Um, in the dialog element. So you could actually have a dialog element that has popover uh, behavior. Now, this is for components that are like a sub window, as I mentioned earlier. So something like that lets you choose how many people you want to take on the train on Austrian railways, or uh, some UI that will tell you about a new feature that your application has. Or even mega, nav mega navigations, they might be uh, a candidate for dialogues, uh, because they are almost like a page on themselves. So there's a bunch of headings, and then underneath is a bunch of links for each of the headings. So it's a huge thing. It could be uh, a dialogue itself as well. Then the second option you have is list boxes. So list boxes are components that let the user choose from a list of things, a list of choices. Uh, and the most common thing is the native select element. It will just, uh, the thing that pops out is just a, a list box, uh, and it will have that role. And also, that applies when you build your own uh, select menu or when you use the new select menu element. That thing that pops out would be a list box. Uh, also, when you're selecting a currency, when you're transferring money, uh, and even when you have a complex combo box where there's a bunch of things going on, of which one is a list of choices, then that list of choices is also a list box. Now, the third option you have is menus. Uh, so that's for components that offer the, a list of choices that are actually actions, like in an application. So they're not links, but they are uh, things that the user can do, like remove something or duplicate something. Uh, an example is the menu that you get in Google Docs, uh, so like the file menu that you use to uh, make a new document or save or those kind of things. 
It's explicitly not for navigation, so it's not for links. And it's also not to be confused with the menu element that exists in HTML. Confusingly, that has a list role, and it has little to do with the, the menu role. They are separate things. Um, and yeah, using menu could complicate things for screen reader users. There's a great post by Marco Zei, who explains about his experience using menus on the web. So it adds a layer of complexity that is sometimes needed, but sometimes overused and annoying. So uh, keep that in mind for menus. Just use it for things that are a bunch of actions that someone can do on the page. Now the fourth part is tooltips. That would probably be a very common thing for tooltips to be. Uh, it's also the most complex in terms of what sort of role is kind of related to that. So the most kind of basic tooltip that you can imagine on the web is what happens when you add a title attribute to an element. Uh, and um, that's somewhat controversial because it doesn't work when you go to an element with just your keyboard. You won't access the contents of the, the title. So that is not great. So um, you can build your own that actually works with keyboards. And uh, if you do that and you have some kind of plain text suggestion, so it doesn't have anything um, in there like headings or links or anything like that, just plain text, then you can use a role of tooltip for that. Whenever it becomes more complicated, uh, like in this case, there is an um, uh, alternative text dialogue on a social medium. Uh, you have a heading, there's a button, there's a bit of text, so there it makes more sense to actually use a dialogue. Uh, so tooltip is basically for uh, only plain text, and then uh, dialogue is for whenever it gets a bit more uh, involved. So those are kind of the different roles that you might apply to your popovers. In summary, a dialogue has the dialogue role that's built into it. And when you have popover, you need to choose between a bunch of different ones. So you can use dialogue, list box, menu, tooltip, maybe others as well. Uh, this is not an exhaustive list, so there could be others too. But I think these would probably be the most common ones that you use together with your popover attributes. OK, now I want to move over to positioning. Um, Yuna has shown uh, anchor positioning. I want to talk about two different ways that you can do uh, uh, positioning. The thing is with dialogue and popover, um, when we're talking modal dialogues, is that both are centered by default. They're in the top layer. Um, and I've been told that the centering uh, exists because that is easier to do in the user uh, agent style sheet. So um, it's a default, basically. Things are centered by default. Now let's build something into this uh, concert website that I have. So basically, uh, what I want to do is uh, I have pictures for some of the concerts that I went to, uh, and I want to show them in a dialog, a bit like the light box that we used to implement so often. Uh, so basically, I'm looping through my concerts, and for each of the ones that have images, I'm going to put in a button that is going to open it. Of course, put on a label. I put on an ID that I can use later to find the, the dialogue. Uh, and I have an SVG there that I hide from screen readers because, yeah, it's decorative. Uh, then I put in a dialogue that I connect to the button. Um, and again, it will have a close button in there, and it will have the image and a title and things like that. Now in my script, I go and look for the dialogues. And then I basically. Um, find the corresponding dialogue, and then add a click handler for the um, toggle uh, uh, event. Or is it toggle? No. Uh, so uh, Sorry, I do it for the click event. So I look for the opener, uh, and then when you click it, I call show modal. So basically, that's how to open a, a modal dialogue. Um, so yeah, this is what that would look like. So I can open the dialogue, and uh, uh, it just works like that. Now, what you'll find is that this happens in the center, and that is something that I didn't do. That's what the browser did by default. Uh, so it centers by default. That's how it's, um, how it's implemented. If you look at in the browser DevTools, you'll see that it exists in the top layer, uh, which is what we would expect because it's a modal dialog. Uh, it has a backdrop that you can style. And in my case, I haven't done a whole lot with that. I've just added a background and a blur. Uh, but you can, as I said, you can go wild and add uh, whatever you want there. So dialogue stay center, uh, and I think that it kind of makes sense. If you have something that's modal uh, and it has a backdrop, it makes a lot of sense for it to be in the center. It's kind of naturally where your user's eyes would go. Now let's build a popover and see what happens there. So if I want to have some filters for my books, um, and I may have just discovered a new way to do that uh, in Yuna's talk earlier. 
But what if I did that like a menu? So I have a button, and that opens a bunch of buttons, so a menu with menu items in them. Um, if I build it that way, what will happen is when I click that, it opens in the center of the page. Now, this is a default that has to exist, but it's not what I want to happen, because I kind of lose where the thing is. It's in the middle of the page, and maybe the only way to make it really discoverable is to add a backdrop, but I don't want that, because uh, it's not a modal. So um, what I'm going to do is add, um, yeah, so I'll, this is, uh, I can show you, so it has auto spacing, basically. Margin auto is in the style sheet. Uh, so it divides the space that is available between the top and the bottom, and then, uh, yeah, that centers it. So both are centered by default, but basically what I want to do is actually position it near the button, so put it nearby uh, and anchor it. Now, we've learned about anchor positioning, but one of the options that you have today, while anchor positioning is still being implemented in, in browsers, is that you calculate it. So um, you can calculate it yourself, or you can use a library. In this case, I've used floating UI. So I'll find a popover. Uh, I'll add an event listener for toggle, um, because it has a toggle event just like the details element that will fire whenever it opens or, or closes. I find the thing that invoked it, and then um, I look for whether it's open or not. And when it's open, I basically run the library and uh, position the thing by setting inline styles for left and top. Now, uh, popovers are displayed fixed. So uh, one thing I did is also to um, change that to absolute, because I, I want it to be there. And then uh, it does position right where I want it. So using a library like that is the thing that you can actually do today. Uh, and um, yeah, that is somewhat easy to, uh, easy to use. I feel like popovers would very often be anchored to the button that they are related to. I can't really come up with elements where that isn't the case, because I keep going back to them. In that case, they would probably be modal dialogues rather than than popovers. I did have to override uh, the margin, because margin uh, auto is the default. And what I found my positioning library would actually take all of that auto space and um, put that in there. So I had to set that to 0 in order for it to position actually in, in the right space. Um, but yeah, that actually worked. So um, I have a position pop over there. Now, the second option is anchor positioning, as Yuna just mentioned. Uh, you can read the editor's uh, draft for that. Uh, Jay, who is here, um, has worked on that. I can probably answer more in-depth questions, and we'll show demos, I've been told, of anchor position stuff, uh, which would be really cool. Uh, and there's a really good blog post by Roman uh, about how this, this thing works. So the positioning situation is that modal dialogues are centered in your page. And I think that's a good default and probably one that you wouldn't change very often. And then in non-modal dialogues, they are just in page flow. Uh, so if you open it with show instead of show modal, uh, it's just going to be wherever it would be uh, in your page. And you can do that with script or with anchor positioning later on. And popovers, they are also uh, centered like modal dialogues. but you'll likely want to override that with some kind of positioning library. Now, remember earlier, I showed um, basically uh, overlay that shows whenever your session times out. That's something that is common when you build government websites and banking websites and lots of places where security matters and sessions are short. Uh, so I wondered what would happen if someone is logged in to my books website and they've opened the popover. And then they've gone and um, uh, seen that, that overlay. So if I do that, if I add like um, uh, an overlay to this, what you'll notice is that it basically goes to, so what I want to do is this, right? I want to display the dialogue right on top of um, the whole page. But what happens if I uh, build that with a role of dialogue? Uh, so I just do div row of dialog. If I do that, it will go behind my popover. And if I do set the next 100 or lots of nines, it's never going to be above the actual popover. So the only way to fix that, as we've seen before, is to change it to a dialog element, because dialog elements with modal are the only ones that can actually be in the top layer and then above the, the popover. Popovers in the top layer, that div was clearly not in the top layer. So what we'll do, we change it to a dialog, and then we run the show modal method on it. That's going to show it as a modal uh, and make it appear right on top of our popover. 
Now, that's important to uh, think about when you start to implement popovers in your design system. If you have any of those uh, older dialogues that aren't using the dialog element, note that they can appear underneath your popovers, because popovers are in the top layer, and your old school dialogues are not. Um, there is a blog post about this as well from Adrian Roselli, uh, which basically talks about this effect and, and warns against using the popover attribute. I wouldn't warn against using it um, so much, because I think it's great to, to use it. But do think about which dialogues do I have, and would they potentially interfere uh, with my popovers. Now, wrapping up, we've looked at a bunch of different UI considerations. So is something modal? Is it explicit or light dismiss? Uh, all these differences are important to take into account when you're building popovers and dialogues. Then we've talked a bit about semantics, where the default semantic for a dialogue is just dialogue. And for popover, you have a choice out of multiple. Uh, and there are lots of different things that you can consider there. Now, the positioning story for modal dialogues, it's somewhat easy because it centers, and you probably want it to be centered. Uh, but there's also, um, yeah, the, um, in the popover case, you will want to do your own positioning, probably with a library right now, uh, and hopefully with anchor positioning soon, because that looks very useful. It will have very useful defaults, and it will give you a lot of control over what should happen when your popover doesn't fit in the viewport and all these kinds of things. Uh, so I am looking forward to, for that to, to exist, actually, in, um, in browsers. Now, with that, I want to thank you very much. My slides will be tweeted out. Um, I'm HDV on most platforms, so you'll find the link uh, right there. So thank you very much. CSS, CSS. Yay. Hey, well done. <laughs> hey, would you please pop over here and have a dialogue with me? Yes. <laughs> I'd been sitting on that one over there. I was like, I think it's going to land. We'll see. Um, also, and I was like, it also works for y'all. Y'all can pop over to him and have a dialogue. So you set yourself up for that one. That wasn't Feel me. free to pop over, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, then it's like, but is it the semantic or the behavior of popping over? <laughs> <laughs> Semantically, we can just have a chat, right? <laughs> well done. All right, so let's take some of these questions. We've got seven minutes, and uh, then we're going to take a five-minute break. So we've got one here from Robert. What's the current fallback that happens when elements like dialog and popovers for browsers that do not support this? That's a good question. So I guess they'll just show. So you'll have an experience that is impossible. You'll have to fix it and do something for it. So either use a polyfill for like popover, there's a good polyfill. Um, because, yeah, it, it just won't show anything, basically. It will just show the contents, I guess, of the, the HTML that's, that's there. It will just display. Uh, the browser in popover and dialogues, it will hide them for you by default. That's one of the key features. Uh, and that hiding won't happen. So you'll have your content sitting there awkwardly. Uh, so it kind of depends on your UI, but very often that's something you would want to avoid, I guess. It's just a div, right? It'd be like, I don't know what this is. I'll yeah. just treat it like a regular thing. Yeah. Awesome. Uh, we've got another one here that says, um, this is a com web components uh, question. Why can't we have nice things in web components by default? So popover target does not work with custom elements. It seems custom elements lag behind these new features. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's not my fault, but yeah, it's true. <laughs> uh, I do think, like, yes, that's important. And if you want to change that, do what Yuna said and get involved, because uh, yeah, we need to hear about these use cases and see what, uh, what people are doing. Good answer. Hey, Jaren, you're out there. It's time for you to go make comments and make some noise. He's right. Uh, this is a question about menus. Um, would you use a dialogue or a popover for an off-canvas menu? Probably popover. Nice. And maybe dialogue, because it could be a dialogue role. So it's like the combination of this, this thing that I showed, like a dialogue with the popover attribute, could be that. But if it's a menu, it would have a role of menu. Yeah, for sure. And one of the things to think about there might be trapping focus. Um, so maybe a dialogue is a little better, since then you'll get a back page that's inert, and they won't find themselves wandering off of the slide-out menu. I don't know. Yeah. 
Yeah, it's, it's all about like finding out these, these user interactions, like what are people trying to do here, and how can we best facilitate that? Often you want to lock the focus inside, sometimes you don't. Uh, and then you can do that for both the modal and non-modal modal elements. So. Nice. Um, Michelle asks, should a primary navigation menu be a dialog or a popover, or neither? Yeah, it kind of depends. So if you have a primary navigation that is very big and it has lots of stuff in it, like it's got headings and it's got buttons and pictures, sometimes it has pictures, then it might be a dialogue. But if it's just some links, then I wouldn't bother adding any of these roles because it would just be too much, I think. Nice. You can overdo it. <laughs> Everything's easy to overdo sometimes. Um, how are popover and dialogue accessible by default for keyboard users? And if so, do you know if there's something in the wiki uh, that they're going to adopt? Yeah. Uh, what we're trying to do like at OpenUI is build stuff that are accessible by default when we can. And that's sometimes tricky because we don't know what the intent is of the author. So the person who's building this component, we don't know what exactly they want to be building. So we don't always know what a good default looks like. But wherever it's possible, these things are built in. So like when you press your escape key, your popover is going to close. Uh, those kinds of things we can know for sure that it will be helpful for end users. For other things we don't know, and then it's your own responsibility, right? So the heuristics are there. Whenever we can guess what the right keyboard behavior needs to be, we will do it. Nice. Uh, is there a way to detect open close state of a popover with CSS? Yes, but I can't remember what the attribute is because it's changed a couple of times. Is popover open? Yeah. Open. <laughs> I was like, I think we went simple in the end, uh, which was good. Jay on the save right there, very nice. <laughs> um, all right, so we've got, uh, so with starting style, don't we need the ability to toggle inert using CSS? Currently, inert is only available as an attribute. Yeah, uh, I don't know. It seems dangerous to move it there because making something inert is a huge thing. Like you're making the whole thing unavailable to lots of users. And if it's just a visual thing, that's one thing. But it also affects screen reader users who can't then access the content that's there. So I don't know. I'd be wary kind of adding that to CSS, I think, and make it an HTML thing. It, there's been a lot of weariness about that, for sure, um, which is interesting, because it seems like CSS can affect the accessibility tree in other ways. Why are we so resistant now? Yeah, I don't like it. <laughs> like, I don't like it affecting uh, accessibility from, from CSS. Uh, but yeah, we do already have a bunch of cases where that is the case, so it would just add on top of that, I guess, yeah. yeah. Uh, are there animation possibilities for showing and closing the popover? Yeah, yeah, Yuna's talk had some, some examples of that. Nice. So uh, yes, yeah, so it can definitely be done, and I think people will, I think we'll see some of these in Jay's talk as well, like some animations. Uh, no pressure, right? <laughs> It's true. We're going to see some animation and popovers. Uh, this one's a weird one, and I'm just going to read it because, well, wait, I wrote it. Um, <laughs> I liked that you mentioned explicit dismiss versus light dismiss. Um, that was just, I hadn't heard explicit dismiss used, so if there's a button to close something, I thought that was really nice. Uh, but it kind of makes me want a dark dismiss to go with light dismiss. Do you think the web platform will get an evil dismiss uh, like <laughs> Ganondorf, and it'll show up when the moon is red? Probably, yeah. If we wait long mm. enough, then maybe that will make its way into browsers. <laughs> there you go, Red Moon, Dark Dismiss. Uh, if you're playing Tears of the Kingdom, that's the reference, Zelda. Anyway. <laughs> Sorry. Uh, thank you so much, Hida. That was awesome. Pop over and have a dialogue with him. Mm.